Grammagat, last can call you Kestiver Hain. Question one. And Keith Buchanan is to answer. Can I thank the member for a question? The Assembly Commission has a strong focus on the health and well being of staff, and this is a key aspect of both the Commission's corporate strategy and its corporate plan. The Commission also has a health and well being framework and a wide range of health and well being resources on the Assembly's intranet. During the period of the COVID 19 pandemic, the Commission issued three regular weekly communications to keep in touch with staff. As many were working some or all of the time from home, each week, well being Wednesday, communications were issued to promote a wide range of resources on health and well being topics. The Commission's employee assistance programme continued to be available throughout the pandemic. Under this programme, staff can avail of 24 7 counselling, online training, and access to a range of electronic resources covering health and well being topics. The Commission also has 18 staff trained as mental health first aiders and our learning and development team regularly promotes activities to assist staff with managing their health and well-being. The Commission will continue to support and promote the good mental health of its staff throughout the pandemic and beyond. Um, I thank the, the member for his um, answer. Um, it is really welcome to hear those resources. Would the member agree that the Commission has a duty not only to ensure staff are looking after their physical health, but their, their mental health and well-being as well, especially given the added pressure that, that many will have faced as a result of the, the pandemic and the extra lo- workload that they will have been carrying? Thank you. Uh, yes, I would agree with you t- totally that obviously the Commission has, has a duty of care to, to all members, and indeed, just moving on from, from staff within the building to uh, our own staff as an MLA personally, and whether that be in the building or remotely in your own constituency offices. And just for your own information, I think the member would be interested that we're also um, there is a service on the, under the tracking and members' support on the CAMS office are currently exploring the delivery of electronic courses on mental health. Awareness through an NICS online training platform. These short training courses will then be available to all members and their staff. So it's not only members in the building, whether they be employees of the, the, the Commission, but our own employees directly. Here, Mayor Cara Hunter, for your case, I called Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and I'd like to thank yourself for being here today um, to answer questions. Uh, my question uh, is: What steps is the Assembly Commission taking to encourage uh, further uptake of the specific mental health support offered by the Commission during the pandemic? Well, uh, there's obviously some parts that I maybe need to get more written clarity for the member. If you don't mind, I will do that. So, through the Commission, if you're happy, that we'll write to you and give you more information. Uh, Kes, there were all. I have a whole question to John O'Dowd, Hon Fregerha. John O'Dowd, to Last answer. Call, yeah. uh, can I thank the member for his question? And with your permission, Mr. Speaker, or, or uh, Deputy Speaker, can I ask for an additional minute as I'm going to answer question two and five together? Uh, I thank the members for their questions. As members will be aware, the Speaker, on behalf of the Assembly Commission, announced in July 2020 the establishment of an Assembly-supported Youth Assembly. Since then, work has been underway to put in place the detailed arrangements for the establishment of the Youth Assembly. A number of important developments have occurred, and I will outline some of those for the members. Two members of staff from the Assembly's Education Service were appointed to take forward uh, the work, and they have been joined by two Youth Participation Officers who started work on the 30th of November. The Speaker is establishing an advisory group to give the Commission access to advice, including from the youth sector, as it takes further significant decisions. Uh, The group will be advisory as opposed to having decision-making powers. A Young Persons Youth Assembly co-design panel has also been established to help co-design some of the practicalities relating to the Youth Assembly notably around recruitment and selection, induction and communication. Up to six virtual sessions of the co-design panel have been arranged for December. Indeed, one has already taken place. Once all of these sessions have been held, staff will write up the outcomes and findings and bring them back to the panel in January to allow it to finalise its thoughts and recommendations. Work also continues with regards to awareness raising, a Youth Assembly web page, an online social media presence have been created. Emails have issued to the youth sector, schools, further and higher education colleges, 
youth organisations and sporting organisations, and over 640 people have signed up to a youth assembly mailing list. Looking ahead, it is hoped that the report of the co-design panel's findings with regard to the recruitment selection will be available for presentation to the Assembly Commission by the end of January. Not surprisingly, the COVID-19 pandemic has had some impact on progress to date and may yet slow the pace of progress. However, as we have said previously, the Assembly Commission is determined that the Youth Assembly will be established and operational as soon as it is possible. And the Speaker has said that he looks forward to hosting the first formal plenary of the Youth Assembly in the Assembly next year, hopefully before the summer. I thank the member for the detailed uh, reply and I'll probably forward some uh, Assembly questions on the information that he supplied, but thanks for that. Uh, would the member agree with me that we need to see some legislation to ensure that the Youth Assembly is permanent, uh, a permanent feature and not dependent or subject to the Assembly uh, time or budgets? And would he also agree with me, I know we talk about the advisory group and the co-design panel, would he agree, agree with me we need to ensure that young people set the agenda and the methodology uh, via some some form of youth uh, steering panel and they include those young people uh, from the NI, NI Youth Assembly uh, who have uh, lobbied to partic uh, participate in it, uh, already so far. Thanks. Thank the member for, for his further questions. The, the member will be aware, even from the information I have given him, that the, the Commission is keen to have young people design the Youth Assembly from the outset and to bring back their recommendations and for the Commission to be directed by, by young people rather than the Commission directing the young people. In terms of legislation for the future, the, the Commission will await the recommendations of the various advisory groups that have been set up and we will move from there. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Alliance Party has supported the campaign to give a voice to our young people throughout my time as an MLA, so I, I welcome this long overdue progress that has been made on the establishment of a youth assembly. Can I ask how members of the youth assembly are likely to be appointed and in what way members of the youth assembly will be able to interact with procedures of this assembly? Uh, thank you, Member, for his question. Again, these will Matters are for the panels, which are currently sitting, who are going to advise the Commission to bring forward. Uh, but we don't want to set out what's going to happen ahead of the panels, having their discussions and making recommendations to the Commission. So this is youth-focused. They're planning it. They're bringing it forward. And the Commission then will roll out the recommendations. Um, the member has outlined um, some of the actions <clears throat> so far which the Commission has, has taken. What actions is the Commission going to do to ensure that the Youth Assembly is inclusive and representative of our increasing diverse society? I uh, thank the member for her question. The, the, the extent to which the consultation has taken pl place thus far I think shows how uh, the Commission has reached out. Over 640 people have signed up to be contacted in relation to matters in relation to the Youth Assembly. And there's also, in terms of the groups that I listed earlier, uh, following organisations have been invited to nominate to the Youth Assembly's co-design panel, the National Children's Bureau, Boys and Girls Clubs, Uniformed Organisations, Youth Work Hub, uh, Girl Guiding Officers, Scouts NI, Girls Brigade, Boys Brigade, uh, Cara Friend, Disability Sport NI, Disability Action. So it's quite a, a broad range of organisations and representative bodies that have been contacted to have input into the design of this. I call William Humphrey. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in a sense, the Minister has answered part of my question. Uh, as someone that declared an interest as a member of the Scout Association, there's a hugely important role in Northern Ireland the Scouts, the BB, GB, and Guides. It's important that their role and contribution to society is, is reflected in this uh, Youth Assembly. Uh, which must be reflective and representative of Northern society. How can we ensure that that actually happens? As the member said, we have, we have contacted a broad range of uniformed organisations who play, do play uh, an important role in our society and even over the most recent period of the COVID pandemic have shown the volunteering spirit uh, of many of our young people. But again, I emphasise this is down to the design panel. They are meeting, they are discussing, the young people are engaging on how they, on what the, the Youth Assembly will look like. So let's wait on their recommendations and move forward from there. Mr Deputy Speaker, question three. 
Serum, Sir Dolores Kelly, Hon Fregata. I call Dolores Kelly to respond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. Uh, the management of the requirements arising from the Working Time Regulations Northern Ireland 2016 for Assembly staff is addressed in the Assembly Commission Staff Hours at Work policy. The purpose of the Staff Hours at Work policy is to establish a fair, equitable and consistent approach to the management and recording of hours worked across the organisation. The policy advises that staff will normally take and record a lunch break of at least 30 minutes each day. The policy also states that it is important to remember that under the legislation a break of at least 20 minutes must be taken of staff work more than six hours. This break must be taken during the working per period and cannot be taken at the start or the end of it. The policy also states the staff must have a break of at least 11 hours between finishing one work day and starting work on the following day. It is the responsibility of all staff and their line managers to ensure that this requirement is met. By way of example, the policy records that if staff work until midnight to cover a late plenary, they should not start work until at least 11 a.m. the following day. Staff record their hours worked, including breaks, during the working day in a personal electronic record, which must be reviewed by their line manager at least monthly. For, assemblies, for assembly staff who work within a shift pattern, the shift rota is developed to comply with the legislative requirements. Rachel Woods for a supplementary. Um, I thank the member for her answer. and The um, member has, has touched upon it, but the member will be aware that in recent weeks, plenary has gone on into the wee hours of the morning. Um, and Under the working time regulations, a worker is entitled to a rest period of not less than 11 hours in each 24-hour period during which the worker works with an employer, as you've outlined. So can I ask that the Commission to ensure staff who are say, here at 3 a.m. are not back in here at 8 or 9 in the morning? Uh, thank the member uh, for her supplementary and the member uh, can be assured that both uh, the Assembly Commission and indeed the Business Committee is very mindful when setting the agenda for business on a weekly basis uh, that we do try to comply with a, a decent finishing time, although of course there are um, untimed debates and I know that uh, the Business Committee, the, the Speaker is bringing forward a paper to look at uh, options that might be available to uh, the Business Committee and to the Commission in terms of the orderly uh, taking of business here, but without constraining the scrutiny and ability of members to ask t uh, questions and to uh, outline uh, their responsibilities in relation uh, to legislation. So uh, there's no doubt that late uh, as, uh, plenary sittings can lead to operational difficulties for a number of business areas within the Secretariat and heads of business and line management are committed to working with their staff as far as possible to ensure that they have breaks in accordance with legislation and Assembly Commission policy. But uh, given the shortness of this mandate, the legislative programme that uh, is before us, uh, I can assure the member that the Commission and the Business Committee are all very alert uh, to uh, the, the Working Time Directive. Aram Sir Gemma Dolan for your case to call Gemma Dolan. Garmi, I'll get last can call you. Um, to ensure staff are getting their breaks and time away from their workstations, does the Commission need to recruit more staff or review work practices? Uh, Thank the member for her supplementary. Uh, the Assembly Commission is absolutely committed to the full and effective implementation of all legislative requirements. Any member of staff who does not feel that the he or she has received a break has set out the working time regulation should raise that matter in the first instance with their line manager. However, um, as the member knows, uh, there has been a, a during suspension there was a uh, uh, not uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of staff redeployed across different business departments and the Assembly Commission uh, and staff in this building is below uh, the, the numbers required and there is an extensive recruitment exercise uh, ongoing at the moment so we would hope to be in a position to fill all of the posts over the coming months. Okay, as the member for question number four isn't in her position and question five has already been grouped with question number two, Anish Bogamish, could you ever share? And Ayr Masa or Melissa McHugh for when you cast. Call Melissa McHugh. Good morning, Agnes Lask and Carla. To ask just the Commission to outline the criteria used to design whether Assembly staff are required to work in Parliament buildings or from home during the COVID 19 pandemic. 
John Blair to respond. Deputy Speaker, thank you, and I thank the member for the question. Throughout the pandemic, the Assembly Commission, like other responsible employers and in keeping with all regulations and guidance, has sought to ensure the health and safety of all users of Parliament buildings, including the health and safety of Assembly Commission staff. Specific measures that have been taken include visible guidance relating to the management of risk through effective hand washing, the implementation of social distancing measures, an enhanced cleaning regime and through uh, expediting and using a widespread policy of working from home where that is possible. In the early stages of the response to the pandemic, the Commission also was acutely aware of the specific issue of staff who were at increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19 and the need for them to be particularly stringent in following social distancing measures. For that reason, in keeping with the guidance in place at that time, staff with specific underlying medical conditions were not required to travel to work. As with the regulations and guidance have evolved, the underlying criteria that is used to decide upon working in Parliament building or at home has remained largely the same. These are firstly, does the work of the Assembly require the attendance of the member of staff in Parliament buildings? If so, that member of staff will attend Parliament buildings in a safe and secure manner. The situation arises for staff from a range of business areas. If attendance is only necessary on specific days or for part of a week, many business areas have implemented a rota system to ensure coverage of Assembly business while mitigating the risk of COVID-19 infection. If the work of the Assembly does not require uh, attendance at Parliament buildings, that member of staff can work from home if his or her duties are amenable to home working. The Commission will continue to ensure that all services required by the Assembly are delivered while safeguarding the health and safety of staff. Thank you for your answer. Uh, it will appear just during the latest lockdown that a significant number of staff continued to work uh, on site, uh, particularly on the fourth floor. Why was this? Deputy Speaker, thank the member for, for the supplementary question. Um, the, the figures around this would, would show that from a staffing body of just under 345 full-time equivalent members of staff, the nature of the risks are such that uh, some 290 full-time equivalent members of staff are able to work from home either for all uh, of the time on, on their own device or on a device provided by, by the Commission. The actual number of staff who are working from home on a particular day will vary depending on the nature of assembly business and the need for a physical presence in Parliament buildings. For example, on a Monday and Tuesday, the number of staff working from home will fall as there is a need for staff to help facilitate plenary business on those days. Similarly, staffing will be needed to facilitate committee meetings on Wednesdays and Thursdays each week. There is less need for staff to be physically present at Parliament buildings on a Friday when there is no plenary or committee business, and hence the number of staff working from home can be greater. William Humphrey, question. I thank the member for his answers so far. Last Thursday, the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Finance and the head of Northern Ireland Civil Service HR were in front of the Public Accounts Committee around this very issue. Uh, one of the, the points that a number of members made to them was the fact that those members of staff who are working remotely have to be managed in terms of targets, deadlines and in terms of productivity. Is the Commission absolutely convinced that that has been happening and continues to happen? Deputy Speaker, thank, thank the member for the question. Uh, during the COVID-19 uh, period, the Commission undertook a survey of staff based on wellbeing communications. I think we will come to this in later questions also. I think the findings of that survey showed that a vast majority of staff felt that they were able to work effectively from home and were trusted to do so. Okay, as the, uh, Mr Beattie is not in place for number seven. Um, I move to number eight. Sir Nicol Brogan for your question. Call Nicol Brogan. Question brief, please. And Keith Buchanan is to respond. I thank the member for her question. The function of the Assembly Commission, as set out in Section 44 of the Northern Ireland Act 1988, is to provide the Assembly or ensure that the Assembly is provided with the property, staff, and services required for the Assembly's purposes. Therefore, the working hours for most staff employed by the Assembly Commission will be directly related to the working hours of the Assembly. A notable exception to that requirement is the working hours for staff who maintain a 24-hour security presence here in Parliament buildings. However, for the vast majority of staff, working hours are dictated by the working hours of the Assembly. 
Those working hours, most notably the duration of sitting times or the scheduling of committee meetings, are not within the gift of the Assembly Commission. Sitting times are the preserve of the business committee and scheduling of committee uh, meetings falls to each committee. However, I am aware that the Speaker has agreed to come back to the business committee with a range of options in relation to how business might be better managed with the heavy programme of legislation which is expected towards the end of the mandate. Therefore, while the Commission has no role in setting the working hours of the Assembly, it has a range of policies and procedures in place, including a staff hours at work policy and a flexible working policy that have enabled approximately a quarter of all staff to utilise flexible working patterns to facilitate better family-friendly or care-friendly work patterns. Well, I am very much a newcomer to the Assembly. Um, I'm already aware of debates that have gone on until 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, while the um, democratic scrutiny of legislation is crucially important, it is, not the case, is it not the case that a few members um, making long, uninspiring and at times repetitive speeches um, means that there is at times more hot air than scrutiny? The long sittings that result um, make this legisl legislature a, a less family-friendly environment for staff and MLAs to work in. In light of such prolonged debates, how does the Commission envisage encouraging all members to be conscious of responsibility to each other and to the staff who support our work here? Well, thank you very much, and you're more than welcome as a new member, and I welcome you to the Chamber. And indeed, um, your words not mine that some members maybe take the long road round, or as the Speaker previously said, they take the detour. That said, I believe that is brought up and discussed maybe about two weeks ago at, at a, a business committee. A meeting which I am a member of, with respect to, we don't want to deter debate or, or stifle debate, but sometimes some members, and I wouldn't want to dare look anywhere around the chamber to indicate who, so, some, member, some members may uh, take us an extremely long, uh, long sentence to say a, sh a short sentence where it's dude. That said, the business committee has discussed this, and the speaker's way to look at that with regard to controlling debate, because I appreciate whenever you go on to two, three o'clock in the morning, it's not family friendly, there's no way of putting that. So it is on hand through the, the business committee and not the commission. I uh, call Pat Catney. As an ex-employer myself, I just did uh, thanks for your answer so far. When was the last time the Assembly Commission surveyed the staff for their views on their working conditions in, at the Assembly? Thank you, the member, for your answer. I'm not actually sure, but uh, I have no doubt my colleagues in the box will take note of that question. And rightly, if you're more than happy with that uh, answer at the moment, we'll get clarity for you, the member. And I call Gloris Kelly to respond. Thank you very much. And I thank the member, Mr. Speaker, for the, their question. I understand uh, that this is an issue which the Commission has considered on a number of occasions over the years. Progress has proven difficult for a range of reasons, including that it has not been possible to obtain suggestions of items which are available to meet these objectives or indeed to achieve uh, political agreement. More, most recently, the Commission considered a request for a permanent display of some of the artefacts owned by Assembly Commission, including some which are currently kept in storage. The Commission was unable to reach consensus on that request, but agreed that officials should explore whether there were artefacts available for loan from other places which would add balance to ensure that any display reflected the entire community. Initial contacts by officials were unsuccessful in identifying potential objects. This work was then paused as a priority was given to re-establishing the Assembly in January of this year and then to managing business in the context of COVID-19. The Commission had a discussion about this issue at its last meeting and agreed that it was an important piece of work uh, and officials are now currently in discussions with Dr Eamon Phoenix in order to try and identify potential artefacts which might be more reflective of the entire Assembly and be available for loan and which could be added to those owned uh, by the Commission. Assuming that potential items can be identified, then uh, officials intend to develop a range of options for the Commission to consider. Thank you. Yeah, um, I thank the member for her answer. Uh, would the member agree with me that we're now 22 years on after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, which promised equality and mutual, mutual respect? So would the Commission agree that 
um, now is the time uh, that they act to ensure that in any displays, paintings, artefacts and symbols um, throughout this building that this should reflect and be representative of all the citizens and the diverse society that this assembly now serves. Gormiogut. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her supplementary, which touches on a couple of areas, one being a, a, a perceived imbalance, and some might say a very real imbalance in terms of the symbolism of this building. And the member will understand there are different views within the Commission on these issues. This building was influenced by the history of the time when it was built, and some might argue that it is less reflective of the current Assembly since 1998, although some of the additions of recent years, including the portraits of former office holders and those those of Seamus Heaney and C.S. Lewis are more representative of the current makeup of our community. It would be misleading if I told the member that I expect it to be easy to take these issues forward in an agreed way, but it's at least positive that the Commission has agreed to look at this area further. And if I might add that there was indeed a 14-week public consultation in relation to equality and good relations in this particular context, and the Commission uh, approved uh, the plan uh, in the current 20 2016 to 2021 Good Relations Action Plan on the 15th of November uh, 2016. The five-year plan set out how the Commission proposes to fulfil its duty under Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act 98 in having regard to the desirability of promoting good relations between persons of different religious belief, political opinion or racial group. And the plan contains a number of actions and anticipated outcomes which may relate to your original question so, uh, of the member of Ms Flynn. Such as the consideration of new art initiatives to allow opportunities to reflect the, the wider community within Parliament building. Thank you. Call Jim Allister. New artefacts are found. Will they too be hidden away in storage at a cost of £12,000 a year, or is that only reserved for existing artefacts? And when will the Commission catch up with our history and agree to an exhibition? of artefacts which it owns to coincide with the centenary of Northern Ireland. Uh, Deputy Speaker, well, uh, I think the Commission and many members and political parties are very sensitive to uh, the, what's called I think, the decade of centenaries, and uh, we have tried to take a mature and respectful approach uh, to that. I think. Uh, the Commission has agreed principles for centenary events which require events to be organised in an inclusive, politically sensitive and respectful way which takes account of different perspectives. The Commission is due to have further discussion at its next meeting in relation to how the centenaries in 2021 will be marked and those events will be consistent with the principles and are required to be agreed by consensus. Call William Humphrey. Thank the member for her answer so far. Given her response and that the Commission has, has been unable to reach an agreement on the display of uh, the artefacts and emblems and paintings and whatever that in the house them in this uh, Parliament, can I ask the, the member what position has the Commission taken about some of those going out on loan, particularly next year as Northern Ireland celebrates its centenary, which is important to many of us? Uh, what is the position's commission, Commission's position on that? Uh, I thank the member uh, for his supplementary, and I think he does make a valid point. Uh, the, there are obviously different views in the communities, and there will be some for whom the centenary of Northern Ireland is much more important and something to be marked than others. The Commission is meeting tomorrow, and I give an undertaking to ha have that particular point tabled and an answer to go back to the member directly. Call Daniel McCroston. Adam Daniel McCroston. For thank you, you, Deputy Speaker, and uh, I welcome this particular question and, and thank the member for bringing it and for the member's answers to them. Uh, has the Commission given any, given any consideration to a lasting monument or memorial to the late John Hume as a key architect of these power-sharing institutions? Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I will have to answer, of course, as a member of the Commission, but I would fully support as an SDLP member the, the, the principle behind uh, Mr McCrossan's ask. It is something which the Commission has not uh, considered, but again, uh, the Commission is meeting tomorrow, and no doubt that that uh, then can also be tabled. Uh, um, but I can't make any promises, uh, because, as we know, it has to be political uh, consensus. Thank you. And on that note, uh, we conclude this item of business. If members take their ease, while we change the top table here and move to the next item of business.